So in the previous lecture, we sort of discussed um, this paper, right? Next generation sequencing technologies, which looks at um, different platforms and the classification between uh, how NGS works, the SBS, the sequence by synthesis and uh, SMS, single molecule sequencing. Right. Um, some aspects of it. Okay. And um, the summary of that I've given you in this file called Technology Notes. Right. Okay. So uh, again, it says if you can see this. Uh, important facts to pay attention to be on, on the NGS videos. I've asked you to look to watch the some of the videos I've compiled in my YouTube channel and I've given you a summary. Um, uh, there are some uh, even uh, better papers that I found recently, but never mind, I will not pile you with that. Um, and so this, this part, paper by McCombie, um, so I give, I've given you sort of the summary of the paper, okay? <clears throat> and uh, so hopefully that will be able to help you out a bit in terms of understanding the topic. And now, um, having understood the, well, the different platforms, uh, the mechanistics, how it works, how you get uh, this data, um, you know the advantages and disadvantages of certain platforms over another, uh, particularly uh, when we're talking about read length, uh, we're talking about, um, hopefully you understand that uh, sequencing is one part, assembly is the other, right? And when you talk about the issues of assembly, I mean, it's just like a jigsaw puzzle. If you have bigger chunks, it'll be easier to, to do compared to smaller chunks, right? So that's why that is the advantage of um, single molecule sequencing. However, uh, single molecule sequencing at the moment is still suffering from about 10% uh, error rate, which is quite high. Uh, so as, as because of that, uh, Money and funds, and you know, work with Illumina. All right, Illumina. I mean, the uh, sequencing by synthesis. Um, but at the end of the paper, also talks about the combination of both. If you have the money and resources, then you can do both, and then so you get the best of best of both worlds. Okay. Now, as I mentioned in the previous class, also. So now we're going to look at why or how. We use this data and, and what can we do with it. And for that purpose, what I've done uh, is to look at NCBI. Um, you know, NCBI, PubMed. Uh, if you don't, let me know. You should know. I mean, that's where you look for papers. I know some of you just look at Google Scholars, but uh, normally we look at, I look at NCBI, National Center for Vital Information. Uh, we go there, look for PubMed. Um, and, and look for papers. And what I've done is actually look at review papers because review papers, this is where normally where you start, you, know, you do research, look for reviews because that is actually a collection of what is the current status of whatever you want to find out. So I have looked at and I think I typed uh, NGS and GWAS. GWAS is Genome Wide Association Studies, NGS. So, and I've come up, I've chosen the top 50 papers, 5-0. Um, and I've done it as such that um, this is the paper. It's not a paper, it's a collection of papers. And what I've given you is a list of 50 papers. Here you can see up here, right? Um, let me just enlarge it a bit more. You can see it here, one, right? And then later you have two and here is three. So there are three, well, there are 50, I think 49 papers. Well, how many papers altogether? About 50. Yeah, last one is 48. 
don't worry. <laughs> I'm not asking you to read all these papers. Uh, <clears throat> what I've done is I've downloaded them, put them in order, in order of the year. So it starts off from about 2007 up to about 2020 and just give you an idea of a, a glimpse of what people use NGS for and, and what are some of the issues. I've also included an abstract. Now, don't, you, you don't read papers just by reading the abstract. But um, for this purpose, I just want to give you an idea of what the paper is about. If you're interested, go to the paper. If you can't find the paper, if you cannot get the paper, please let me know. I can easily get it for you. Um, I've got some of the papers, in fact. Um, but the whole idea of this exercise is to have a look at what people use NGS for and what has been the development um, since it first started. And then, you know, you can see the, the concerns and people move from just finding the variance and then they look at function and so on. So this is the purpose, all right? So we're going to do that. There, as I said, there are about 50 papers, 48 papers. Um, we are going to probably do the first 20 today. We'll see. You know? So I'm going to spend this lecture and perhaps the next lecture just to do this part so that um, uh, you, you'll get an idea. Now, this paper have also been highlighted, again, to help you out in the reading. Um, and to help you even more, I've actually come up with the notes, all right? So this is what we are going to be focusing on today, all right? Okay, uh, right. So, this is already on your spectrum, okay? Um, I'll just start off. Okay, and if you have any, any questions, let me know, right? Okay. So, uh, remember I mentioned, okay, the history of sequencing, you start off with, again, I'm telling you this so many times already, this history of, starts off, started off with um, a, a different uh, technologies, the Sanger sequencing, the Maxim Gilbert, there's also others, but at the end of the day, uh, Sanger sequencing sort of won the competition and became the standard uh, for sequencing. And then they improve on the machine from using gel, from using radioactive, right? So here you go, you see the use of radioactive label isotopes was replaced by fluorescent detection, right? And um, the use of gels, slab gels, you know, uh, sequencing gels was replaced by capillaries. Now you run them on capillaries, you don't use gels anymore. Uh, for detection, uh, we used to use x-ray film when I was studying my PhD. I didn't get to do that uh, because when I started, um, the fluorescence detection was just introduced and my lab just bought one. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't have to. Although I thought, uh, although it will be nice to actually uh, use X-ray film. I use X-ray film for something else, for detection of uh, uh, microsatellites. But I didn't use them for sequencing. X-ray film was abandoned in favor of laser fluorescent detection. So this, the newer uh, machines use fluorescent detection, use capillaries, and then uh, laser-based detection. So this is the current system. and. Uh, in previous last previous class, I said you know you have a sixteen. You can development was that you can run sixteen samples and then you can run at one go. Then I think you can run at ninety six samples. I I stopped at ninety six, but actually uh, there are machines that can run three hundred and eighty four reactions simultaneously. All right, so uh, I mentioned ninety six in class. Actually, that there are times there are four four times ninety six that can be run. Okay, anyway. Uh, we know that the human, the first draft of the human genome was published in 2003. Okay, this one going back to what, what I'm trying to do now is to look at uh, the development of NGS. All right. Um, okay, so the NGS first start. There's a there's something called Lynx. Uh, Lynx was then bought over by Illumina. All right, that was in the year 2000. 
but at that time it was still introduction and only by 2004 you actually get the first papers and this was led by 454 the roche uh, the roche platform roche 454 and they were doing very well and they at that time in the the hip term was pyrosequencing uh, pyrosequencing is you know where they, they instead of detecting the nucleotides they detected the pyrophosphate all right uh, so that's why it's called pyrophos pyrosequencing and remember the other one ion torrent they actually looked at a release of hydrogen, remember? Um, so pyro sequencing was, was popular then. And then uh, a company called Selexa uh, released a, um, uh, an in machine in 2005 called GA Genetic Analyzer. And again, this one um, was bought again by Illumina. So Illumina has actually bought different platforms. And they've actually uh, developed the Selexa and and until today they have been the leading they have been leading the market in terms of uh, uh, NGS sequencing remember the ABI system the solid right it was introduced in 2006 and then features very high accuracy but uh, it was a bit slow and it was a bit expensive and then um, uh, you've, you should have seen this, this helicos, the ion torrent. Uh, so this is a bit of history of NGS. Uh, also a note there to say that helicos actually went bankrupt in 2012 because uh, I think that the machines were expensive. Remember I mentioned that uh, one of the machines was like 900,000, 999,000, close to a million kind of thing, right? So that was, the. this is this short history of NGS. Now in human genetics, okay, now we are going to the paper, the, the 50, the 48 papers that I found it now. Um, how I've written is that this in bracket or in square brackets, this refers to the paper, right? Uh, the paper, I mentioned the paper was numbered 1, 2, 3, and 248. Um, just in case you didn't catch what I mentioned earlier, uh, I was referring to this number up here. This is number 6. Next one is number seven, seven, and so on. Okay, so the square brackets refer to these numbers, and I've also added uh, the year. So um, one of the first papers that the the review say, see for example. So now you see in two thousand and seven, there's already a review of various studies. So that's how 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 quickly the 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 technology moves. Remember, it was only the first few machines was only available 2004, 2003. By 2007, you've already a lot of people have already doing a lot of research on on using NGS, and they started to review uh, studies. So 2007 says NGS provided evidence for of association and can be used as a guide to determine drug effectiveness and safety. Now they were looking at um, a group of patients where you know because previously. I, mean, I mentioned this previously. I mentioned that you know some people drink coffee and cannot sleep. Uh, some people drink coffee and you know and I, I, for me, for example, I I like to drink coffee at night because somehow I sleep better with coffee. You know, uh, my mother, for example, cannot sleep if she drinks coffee. She, if she even if she even drinks co coffee at late evening, like six o'clock, then she'll have problems trying to sleep at night. You know, so I don't have that. I, I actually drink strong coffee without sugar without anything just coffee um, you know before i sleep at night so 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 when patients have any particular disorders they just give treatments and from these treatments they found that there's some people who respond well some re respond who, some some who did not respond and what's worse is that some were even uh endangered by by uh by the drugs, you know, they, they, they develop uh, adverse reactions and so on. So, so giving treatment is, is sort of a guesswork before that. So, but now they, they were able to do some genetic studies and show that um, they were able to type, to find some association between some variation that can be linked to drug efficacy. So that means they know that, okay, this group, if you have this, this, this variation, then you are going to develop, you can respond very well. Another group, if you don't, uh, then you're not, they're not going to respond. All right. If you don't have this. And also they were able to, do, to, 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 to show that, you know, certain groups having this, this, this 
these are very, they cannot take the drug because it's very dangerous. Yeah. So things like that, all right? So that was done in 2007. And then uh, there was also a review saying that, okay, now with all this data, personalized medicine is now regarded a reality. Because previously that's what people talking about, you know, like uh, designer babies are some of the issues. Uh, designer babies, um, you are able to select what babies you want and, you know, prenatal diagnosis and among them are personalized medicine. But it, this are, I did, before that it was it was items of that you see in the movies, you know. But now they said that with G with with NGS is now perhaps a reality. Why? Because you know related to the study above, you know, you know who who, who personalized now, not to the extreme that you know, or oh, for this individual you, you know, you, you you take this particular medicine. So, but in actual fact, you can actually tell uh, which group of people will benefit further so the doctors if this technology is able is 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 the cost can be cut down that means looking at uh, the patient you know with whatever whatever genotype the patient is will determine what kind of treatment so this is what they mean by personalized medicine and uh, identification of genes predisposing to coronary artery disease located in you know, finding replicated and then this finding was replicated. Now, there was this was also the time when they actually um, looked at different studies in different regions of the world and say, have you found the same thing? Uh, you know, so because this is one of the problems. Here in Malaysia, we don't do this. Well, we haven't done this. We are starting to do this. Say, for example, we want to treat hypertension, um, you know, like... Uh, uh, um, whatever heart disease and so on. The only data available is for the Euro European community, European, European patients or Caucasian patients. Can we in Malaysia immediately look at the genetic components, the genetic uh, factors that have been found for that option and just apply it? Yeah. Um, so this, this is where uh, that studies, replicated studies means, you know, this is what the groups of scientists are doing this. They want to see whether different populations doing different studies, are they showing the same things? That means are they shared? And, 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 and it's not a yes or no answer. Some, some diseases, some, some, some genetic factors are actually shared, but quite a lot are not. That means whatever you found for one population is actually just suitable for that population and not um, applicable. In Malaysia, we need to do our own study, we need to look at our own variation and start developing our own uh, diagnostic tools, right? So they, they actually looked at this and um, they actually looked at about 45,000. Why is the range from 23,000 to 40? Because they have various studies. They start out with 23,000 and towards the end, they also included some other studies and they have 45,000 individuals in their study. And I can tell you in, in Malaysia, it's not, it's not easy to do that kind of study because it involves a lot of money and really, really big organization. Uh, this paper, paper number four, looks at CNV. Um, it's not, there's not a lot of paper on CNV. CNV is copy number variation. In, instead, of in, instead of just looking at variation, SNPs are variation, substitution. But um, uh, this paper, 2008, paper number four, suggests that perhaps, you know, rather than just looking at variation, you also, also need to look at copy number. Copy number is how many times that particular sequence is repeated in the genome, right? Uh, because sometimes uh, the more copies of the genes means you have a higher expression and things like that. So there's not many studies on CNV. Um, uh, but you know, but that has been mentioned in early, as early as 2008. Um, this paper by Nakamura is quite interesting. Um, he is uh, quite a prominent um, um, scientist in um, in human genetics, and uh, he actually wrote. Um, um, he actually wrote. Uh, hang on. He actually wrote a review of his account of, of the developments, you know, from his, his, his beginnings from when he started as a scientist until towards the end of his career. So um, that's just a, a, 
and 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 and, and the in in a way is also giving you a, a summary of the developments. Um, these two studies, six and seven, uh, looks at genetic basis of six skin pigmentation, how our color skin color differs, and uh, they've pinpointed some nucleotide uh, DNA variations that exist in the uh, the melanosome and the melanin biosynthetic pathways, and um, okay, um, this paper uh, I. I just put a note here. No, notes, when you see notes, that, that is some of my, um, something that I remember that I want to tell you. So now it says during the, this times, uh, quite a lot of research are focusing on SNP in genes. Now, um, studies in SNPs, look at variations. Um, early on, the studies were focusing on variations within genes. I mean, they, they were looking for mutations. Uh, simply because if you see a, uh, a variation in a coding region, then you can um, immediately tell what is the problem, right? So a lot of focus at that time uh, were focusing on genes. I said made later, so it was found that most uh, Associated enzymes are non-coding. I mean, there's a late, late paper later uh, that says that you know, um, in cancer associated SNPs, the SNPs are actually on non-coding regions. And non-coding means what? It means it could be in um, regulatory region and so on. So this is just um, something that I uh, remembered that I wanted to mention. Also, um, you may you may. Uh, come across the term later, some looking at this paper, a term called candidate genes. What are candidate gene approaches? Um, suspects. Um, you know, for example, uh, in, in retinitis pigmentosa, uh, it is caused by uh, a death of the rod cells. They look at what is expressed in the rod cells they see that, oh, rhodopsin is one of the genes that are expressed in the rod cells. And so that means that become a suspect. Probably if you have mutations in the gene, you know, so whatever genes that are thought to be uh, linked to any particular uh, phenotype, although they have not been shown to, those are candidate genes, right? So um, studies at that time, you still have that mentality of looking at individual genes. So using, using uh, NGS, they look at selected genes that they know, right? Uh, so, um, so that's why I'm trying to say, you know, um, at that, when, when it first started, people look at, people tend to look at genes that they know have functions. Um, because, you know, because 2003, the whole genome is, is already sequenced and they already know most genes so you know, so why why should they look at elsewhere? So that's why they focus on genes. But later they have found that oh, actually, there are a lot more to it than just coding the sequence. We now appreciate the fact that uh, ninety eight percent of the genome is transcribed. Why? Because you have a lot of regulatory RNAs, right? So that's why um, uh, nowadays it is it is appreciated that variations are not only important when they are found in genes. Variations are also important when they are found in non-coding regions. Anyway, um, paper number six talks about genetic basis of skin pigmentation, and then this is followed by GWAS in anthropology. Uh, looking at uh, the importance of sampling definition. Um, in any particular, in any research that you do, one of the things you want to be able to define well is your sample and what does it represent. Uh, the authors in that study um, picked up a few papers that says, that uses the term the Indian population. I mean, I'm talking about Indian, India. Uh, they say Indian population, Indian population. So it says that's not right, that's not correct because the India social structure, uh, population structure is very defined by 
a lot of different uh, ethnic based factors. So that since you, if you want to talk about, um, I mean, if you learn this in population genetics, you know, you, you do you remember P square plus two P Q plus Q square is equals to one, you know, that, that P plus Q is equals to one, that kind of, that equation, those equations only, is only applicable when the population mates at random. Pen make tick. I'm not sure whether you, you can click, you can make this connection. When they said mating is random, so that means, you know, uh, then you get Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, it's very important, but most most of the time they are not really emphasized. If we talk about how do you equilibrium, that only occurs if there is random mating. So that's the same thing with population. No? Are we randomly mating? Even if in Malaysia we do some population studies, we cannot just take samples and then just a group of hundred individuals and presume that this is Malaysian. We cannot do that, you know, because our marriage, our, our, our uh, society is still bound by ethnic. Uh, although there are cross marriages, but the majority of Chinese, will marry Chinese, Malay will marry Malay, Indian will marry Indian. So we are staying in, the, we're still in that community. So if I want to study the Malaysian population, I would have to look at all these three different races. And not just that, we also have the, uh, the you know, the, the Sarawak, you know, the Bajau, the whatever. So again, this has to be taken into account. You, can, you cannot just go to the hospital and start collecting samples without looking at the ethnic. So this is what, what this is addressed by this paper. Um, so it says whatever conclusions you want to make must look at the social and the population structure as well. All right. So if you have any questions, eh? uh, please stop me. It says cannot generalize result and must understand population. So this is 2009.